Okay. Welcome everybody. I'm Joan Hawkins. I'm the chair of the Writers Guild of Bloomington, and I'm also the co-coordinator with uh, with Tony Brewer of this first Wednesday spoken word series. And I just put the um, the order of the evening's events in the chat. So hopefully you'll be able to see to see it. Um, so I have a bunch of announcements to make. So our, our uh, series is sponsored by the uh, Writers Guild of Bloomington, of course, and in part by the Indiana Arts Commission, the Bloomington Arts Commission, and the Bloomington Urban Enterprise Association. The Writers Guild of Bloomington wishes to acknowledge and honor the indigenous communities na native to this region and recognize that Indiana University and the city of Bloomington were built on indigenous homelands and resources. We recognize the Miami, Delaware, Potawatomi, and Shawnee people as past, present, and future caretakers of this land. So as I said, a lot of, of, um, of announcements. We maintain a third Sunday right uh, program. It's a with still being done virtually. So it's a private Facebook page and you respond to prompts that are posted monthly. People respond to you. And for more information or to join the group, please contact Shauna Ritter. And her email is Shauna747 at gmail.com. Please include Third Sunday in your subject line. And I should say at the beginning that as I go through these, it's, just, it's a lot to keep track of all of the information is listed at our website, which is Writers Guild Bloomington, all one word, dot com. So there's a poetry reading by members of the Afro-Latin Afro Afro Poets. Uh, it's a multicultural reading featuring members of the Afro-Latin Poets and hosted by Lisa Kwong. Um, and that's going to be taking place this weekend, a wonderful series of events. The Afro-Latin Poets are established in 1991. It's a collective of diverse writers whose work generally centers on family, identity, place, social justice, and or history. Committed to challenging stereotypical notions and definitions of Appalachia and important diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts that serve to dismantle institutional racism in our home region. Um, so as I said, it's a, a wonderful program. There's going to be a screening of the film Cold Black Voices, a poetry reading, and a panel discussion. And poet and professor Frank X. Walker will offer a, write, a creative writing masterclass. And the masterclass is co-sponsored by us, the Writers Guild, but all the events are free and open open to the public through registration, though registration is required for the masterclass. And there are only 20 seats available. So once again, you can get information about that and about how to register at writersguildbloomington.com. And a big shout out to Lisa, because it's been a lot of work. Um, first Sunday prose reading and open mic will be Sunday, November 6th at three over at Morgan Stern Books. The featured readers are James Dore and Dan Grossman. Um, Ortet, the wonderful uh, creative jazz ensemble that I sometimes uh, do spoken word with, will be having their CD release party Wednesday, November 9th, next Wednesday, 7 p.m. at the Blockhouse Bar. And that's part of the call and response jazz series. We two sets at 7 and 9.30, including guests Kyle Quas, David Miller, Joan Hawkins, Brooke Nicole Plummer, and it's a $10 uh, donation at the door. There is also uh, Brooke, Brooke Nicole Plummer's birthday poetry party, which is the final show of the Dirty 30 Poetry Tour. She's turning 30 in high style. Um, and that will be featuring Tony Brewer and Brooke Nicole Plummer. That's Saturday, November 12th at Antumbra, which is a new performance space curated by Artisan Alley on uh, South Rogers in the Secretly Building. That'll be at 7 p.m. And again, guest right artists include Ortet, Hiromi Yoshida, Eric Rensberger, Joan Hawkins, Ian Uriel Girdley, and more poets to be added because it is a party. Beer and wine will be available. And once again, I am going through this stuff really fast, but writersguildbloomington.com, you can find everything you want to know. Um, the annual meeting and elections for the Writers Guild open mic potluck will be Saturday, uh, Saturday, December 3rd at 1 p.m. at the University Baptist Church, and that's 3740 East 3rd Street. And again, all this information is on our website. And you can also, if you're at the website, you can sign up for the, um, for the, the 
kind of weekly newsletter, depending on how my life is going at any given week. Um, and you will get this and, and more information about um, publishing opportunities, grants, and so on. So our running order tonight, um, Jason, uh, Jason Fickle will be uh, starting, and then we will have our poets seven minutes each. Jason will come back again. Our poets will come back again for seven minutes each, and then we'll close out with a kind of a one-piece slam, and Jason will end, and I will tell you about next month's events. So to begin... Um, guitarist and songwriter Jason Fickle creates music that connects the heart and soul of the blues with country music's wry chronicles of loss and longing. And he sometimes does Blue Monday on WFHB, and it's always my favorite part of the show. A longtime member of the Bloomington music community, he has performed with the Firehouse Rounders, WFHB's Firehouse Follies House Band, Jason and Ginger, and the VLF Trio. Tony, I'm getting reverb again. And um, and so here's Jason. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I want to start off with a very quick instrumental that began as a uh, as an acoustic guitar instrumental that I wrote years ago, and remained untitled uh, for years. And then through a series of adventures and misadventures, the song became the theme song for the Firehouse Follies. Um, so. Um, uh, which was the WFHB Firehouse Follies uh, Madcap um, Variety Show, of which Tony Brewer was a big part of. And so this goes out to Tony Brewer and uh, to the memory of our good friend, Michael Kelsey. Um, this, uh, this one, uh, this is one I wrote called, I Saved Your Life. I saved you from years of holy matrimony. I saved you from hours of acting like a phony. Why are you so hateful? You really should be grateful to me. I saved you from hundreds of little white lies. I saved you from afternoons rolling your eyes. Why are you so spiteful? You really should feel delightful about me. I saved your life. You think I wrecked it. I saved your life. You think I wrecked it. All your anger is complete misdirected I wrecked your life that's what you say but you gonna thank me some
I saved you from so much idle speculation. I saved you from whole days of awkward conversation. That's gotta be worth something. Don't tell me that means nothing to you. I saved your life. You think I wrecked it. Maybe you're trying to be ironic. I can't detect it. I wrecked your life. That's what you say. Gonna thank me some old day. Mm -mm -mm. I saved your life. The last one I'm gonna do in this uh, little opening set here is um, is uh, one that I recorded a while back. It's called "My Girlfriend Is Gonna Sing a Couple Songs Tonight." And it's dedicated to anybody who's ever been in a band. Well, the mics are checked, the amps are set. Everybody's almost in tune. Just a couple more minutes, then we'll start the show. So sit back, boy. And hear me out I got an announcement to make My girlfriend Is gonna sing A couple songs tonight Now I know it's not what we had planned But I already explained how you'd understand If I said my girlfriend Is gonna sing A couple songs tonight We're gonna do one that she wrote And then a Beyonce note for note You're gonna be knocked out when my girlfriend Sings a couple songs tonight And if it all goes really well Well, you can never tell she might join the band and sing a couple songs every night. <laughs> Just a couple every night. Well, the mics are set, amps are checked, everybody's almost in tune. My girlfriend is gonna sing a couple songs tonight. That's right. My girlfriend is gonna sing a couple songs tonight. Right. Thank you so much. <laughs> so thank you to Jason. Although I must say, having been that girlfriend of more than one occasion, <laughs> I may have a bone to pick with you. Um, so our first featured reader tonight is Soleil David. She's a poet and translator. She received a BA from UC Berkeley and an MFA from Indiana University. Her honors include the Peter K. Jansen Memorial Travel Fellowship, a scholarship to Breadloaf, and the Don Carlos Polanka Memorial Awards for Literature. She's a senior editor for Translation at the Margins. Please uh, welcome Soleil. Thank you, everyone. Um, thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. It's good to be um, back in Bloomington, you know, virtually. Um, really great to hear like all the familiar names of um, places like uh, the Block House and new places. Um, I'm, you know, so, so glad to hear of new places. Um, uh, 
springing up in Bloomington. Um, I'm gonna start um, with some new-ish poems. Um, they're kind of um, about, I, I call them kind of like my seasons poems um, and also, you know, uh, depression poems. <laughs> yeah. Uh, start with picking peaches with your family in Georgia. Maybe the best thing is asking your dad to hold down a branch of a tree for you while you trust your knees to hurdle you up enough to reach that one peach winking at you, blushing red at the sight of you. And when your palm connects, you know that it's ripe by the tenderness that meets your hand and which in turn demands tenderness from you. Your heart ground down these last few months, staring at the possibility of sudden sweetness. This one's called, I started early, took my dog, with thanks and apologies to Emily Dickinson. I didn't see the dogwood flower last year. I was cooped up, looking out from the tall glass of the new apartment. But here I am, a chaperone to my little one's tour of the new mulch scent, baby greens of grass pushing their way to a sharp nose. The world is a collar, and I am sunlit, and I am breathing and alive, if only to tell him stay, or most often no, and to lead him home, finally a little bit tired, a little bit amenable to laying down at my feet while I try to get the work done, the work we all do, that is, the work we all can't help but keep working at. Um, this one's called Equatorial. Um, this was actually turned into a song by um, a student at um, the Jacobs School of Music. Um, you know, one of the highlights of my, of my uh, career there um, at Bloomington. Equatorial. Where to look for blue in the infinite Midwest gray, I can't imagine. Color, I mean. I watch the tree outside my window lose its edges, drain into done. Even the sight of its branches snapping brings only muted sound, muffled. Give me the unquiet of a sudden thunderstorm. High mornings that blind, rouse you violent from sleep. A far off hill for the viewing, mountains beyond that. This current sky never plans for pyrotechnics, be it prismatic fireworks unending, or the orange cloud cast above a staring volcano, otherworldly. I suppose I should be thankful for calm, but I'd like to make contact with the sun soon, its rays for the unabashed taking, traips through wind that carries salt in its wake, grip palms in their sun-washed greens. Come, don't you feel it? The way your feet can't help but run to the sea, pulse drumming with the approaching waves. And this one's um, kind of an older poem um, set in uh, Seoul, South Korea, um, where I taught for about a year. Um, it's called uh, the Taegukgi on the bus ride from Apkujong to Kyongnitan. And the Taegukgi is um, the Korean flag and Apkujong and Gyeongnidan are um, districts in South Korea. Fumes rose from the cell phone case I had hoped to salvage by painting clear nail polish on its fragile surface. Bubbles formed where pattern should have chipped off. My bus had snagged the Korean flag on its side mirror. The red and blue of its tegu banged on the door intent on decapitating me the interloper dying to be gone on the next flight I could afford. Taking his time, the driver furled the flag at the next bus stop, smoothing the creases, head bowed. Sorry, how long have I been um, muted? I'm sorry, actually, I haven't been keeping track. I don't know. Um, 
Uh, let's just the last, last, just the last few lines, last three or four lines is all. Okay. Um, I could um. um Okay, I have some time. I'll just do. I'll just do that one again. Sorry. Okay. Uh, the the Tagukgi on the bus ride from Apujong to Kyungnidan. Fumes froze from the cell phone case I had hoped to salvage by painting clear nail polish on its fragile surface. Bubbles formed where patterns should have chipped off. My bus had snagged the Korean flag on its side mirror, the red and blue of its Tagukg banged on the door, intent on decapitating me the interloper dying to be gone on the next flight I could afford. Taking his time, the driver furled the flag at the next bus stop, smoothing the creases, head bowing. Oh, to love a country so fully. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll end this set with um, this poem called Acknowledgements. One. I would not call our family history a gift, but here is what is, defiance. Two, we terrorized passing cars that interrupted our street game as if we owned the neighborhood. Three, immigrant sisters getting to know each other in a country too new to really know us. Four, do you know this? That I never once felt that I was growing up alone. Five, because you kept giving me piano lessons despite all my sneaking away. My singing voice, your singing voice. Six, where I learned this scorched earth tactic of a blood war. This too is loyalty. Seven, those too cold for us LA nights, the studio that held too much. You were suffering then too. Eight. You bring laughter back, the kind I thought I had lost along with my country. Nine, where do you think did I learn this writing business? You at your desk scribbling. 10, in the library, pouring over hard covers, your bones ashing in a drawer. Is this legacy? Thank you. Thank you, those are lovely. Really lovely. And um, Jason Poster, he was happy that you had that you reread that one poem, and I am too. Um, so our second reader this evening is C.S. Matthews, who is the co-author of Fearful Architecture and editor for the Grindstone magazine, as well as the cover artist for many a book. Having cut her teeth as an independent journalist and medic during the 2020 protests, their work focuses heavily on activism, their indigeneity trauma and their experience being transgender. So please join me in welcoming CS, whom I know as Snow. Hi, how's it going, everyone? That's good. Um, so as this is Indigenous Heritage Web, and I'm mixed, I'm actually going to start off with a piece that I wrote for a book I'm working on called Phrenology about my experiences being trans and indigenous. And um, it's called Wende Do. As far as I can tell, the stories of the Wendado start with the colonizers arriving, spirit of greed consuming until families consume themselves. I was told they ran through treetops. My brother's tree was topped, the one over his grave. Some stories treat them like vampires rising from the grave. The hunters told stories of a man butchering his family. My father tried to kill us after my brother died. Out of unstable hunger, he ate them. My father threw the meat scale at my mother when the doctor said to cut back. And colonization affects our communities as we chant land back in the colonizer's tongue, praying to their God. My father was learned, or my father learned to pray when he married my mom. And when Dago spirit possessed hunters who were paid to hunt their own, taught to scout by Hamburg invaders. My hair looks like my mother's, curls part Irish, part Creole from my father. And we banded together under aim to fight back to be taught, became complacement on table scraps. My mother's ancestors hunted my Creole family during the Civil War, tortured and lynched them, cut babies from their living bellies of my Seminole relatives. But the war has never ended despite them taking our children in the night, cutting their hair and tons, throwing them in mass graves. 
My family tree is a Wendigo. My body, the collected parts of rape and genocide. Its roots are consumption, cannibalistic, killing itself to feast, grow. So we fight on Standing Rock in the streets of Oakland. We scream our stolen languages and are at the Pope from our stolen tongues. We burn churches and plant three sisters in their wake. We are the survivors of genocide that run circles as when day goes wear our feathers. I wept when they found the graves, wanted to scream, but there was no air, wanted to burn, but I couldn't stand. I spoke to a survivor at 2 a.m., talked her off the roof, convinced her to go to ceremony. She drove 200 miles that night. Our siblings are stolen and red on highway of fear, a trail of tears on stolen land littered with stolen bodies, our bodies consumed as our medicine is misused to get a buzz, a high, and addiction steals our lives. We lit over 7,000 candles. They found over 10,000 bodies, 11 schools out of 500. When the Pope came, I folded like a prayer tie. My hair is heavy on my head. So we fight to decolonize our bodies, lives, but it feels like no one is watching. And um, the next one is also from that book. It's uh, called After Oxygen. And uh, yeah. I lost my breath in a car wreck and he stole it with closed vents. Carbon monoxide poisoning the mind after my brother hung himself to get off after my father choked him to move on. And my father stopped breathing only after and my mother stopped hearing only after I asked for help. Before my asthma went away, replaced by a hand on my throat, a noose on my neck. And I learned the pleasure, pleasure of suffocation, trying to end it. Maybe my father needed the dopamine after my brother died. Maybe my brother needed the rush after my father choked him. Maybe my body learned to love a lack of oxygen. Oxytocin was used to induce me. My father pulled me into the world by my black right arm. No blood flow, nerve damage, can't feel a thing. Am I used to a lack of circulation? When I was five, my father wrote a suicide note, refused to take me to my mother, said he would take me with him. This was after my brother died, after he clogged the vents to end us all, before he died, before I was held by my throat above a balcony, before I hung myself, learned how not to breathe, but after my brother died, after oxygen. Yeah. And I think I'm just going to do two more for this first a little bit. Um, this one is called Lodge. You don't know what to wear when you meet your grandfathers. The blankets drive away the light weighted by hide, but you know he'll see you glowing red and you'll know you'll lay your face to the ground, gasp for air, wheezing prayers out from the stone, burning behind the buds on your chest. They burn, a reminder of your years of denial of hiding. And he knows you, chose you from the fire, loves you for your sacred and afraid. You don't want to disrespect him, he was molded under pressure, ruled and washed over for thousands of years to find you, to honor you, to love you, to be put through fire, mined from the ashes, doused in water so the steam can carry your prayers. And you want to honor him, his journey, his love as he honors yours. There have always been owls. They sit in the field where light flickers and the light is yellow faintly, outlining the bones of a harvest It hides mountains. Their memory a haze of the smoke are the smoke of fires in your eyes, bringing tears as you stare at the grandfather's flowing red. He called to you and you felt it. The shape of his curves, the chill in your arms as you held him, the pink flexed red now. He called and you answered. You all did. Four grandfathers apiece. Eighteen stones. It's a pretty number right now as you stare. Eighteen. You mouth feels the syllables, the memory of them round, specked pink rolling through the river and the mountains, hidden just beyond the smoke, past the bones, the soft yellow light, the sound of wind and the rafters as you sleep, dream of the owl in the field, watching, warning. You glance to him in the flames, just through the flap as you circle the pit into shadows, whisper silent thanks as the grandfathers are brought in. The air tastes of bare root. You can barely breathe through the songs, but sing, feel the grass between your toes, cold, and you pray, tears mixing with sweat dripping from your nose as you lean forward, shaking, your words flowing, prayer and song mixing, flowing as your mind, you see her just behind the smoke, past the bones, hidden by light no more. The mountains rise, growing from blue seeds planted, budding from your chest, they break free, no longer hiding, but they rise and you whiff them. Shame and witch. 
And uh, the last one is one that came out in the Grindstone second issue called Noted Medicine. I'm listless, resentlessly aim or relentlessly aimless, lying in the shadow of a moon new, born red from the shadow of star, cold, and I'm sweating, relentlessly abetting, wandering in still oceans as the tide sits dead, drawn no more by this bloody orb, and the sky is on fire, bombs over Gaza, and the Dead Sea sits red, unmoving, like I, despondent on satin sheets worn thin, sleepless in the shadows, cast by a star in demise. Dwelling on my blood, uprooted from home and grave, and the air is heavy with the coming rain, it burns the air. Like the Colombian cities reddened, the skies over Gaza, I too wish to burn. To light my skin golden, but my mind wanders to the braids that hang limp at your funeral. And my lungs burn from medicine misused, and my cheeks are dry as the leather gifted when my mind wanders to the pandemic that kept me from you. Tears only coming from the truth that I left. Chained myself into a cage of work and hid from myself and you who gave everything and the way they take everything from our cousins in cages along the border drawn in our blood. And the moon is red, casting shadows over my skin, bruising me in omens like the serpent that brings black floods. The first drop strike a chest to flat and it smells of fisheries on fire and micmac. And I want to rise up, topple statues, paint Lincoln's face red, but the water burns, sedates, no longer washes away my pain. Sickly and sodden sheets, sicky black remains as Mississinabe entwines me, corrupted by greed. And Anamik is dead, killed by the satellites that litter our skies. And the moon is red as a dot they wish to colonize. Like Palestine, like my mind, like your lungs, like the bodies of my sisters in red, I want to rise. But I can't breathe, like Floyd in the streets and it's circling, black as the boot, crushing the wind from my lungs and I'm choking and the smoke in the sky, bodies burning along the Ganges, the birds are swarming in their plastic glory and I want to rise, but I might just die like so many before me, left only the thoughts and prayers, hollow words like empty bottles stacking, no good medicine left unsinged. Thank you. Wow, that was really intense. Thank you. Um, our, our third uh, featured reader tonight is Annette Sisson, who is from the Hoosier State, but has lived in Nashville, Tennessee since 1988. Her book, Small Fish and High Branches, was released by Glass Liar Press in May 2022. Her chapbook, A Casting Off, was released by Finishing Line in 2019. She was a Mark Strand Scholar for the 2021 Sewanee Writers Conference and 2020 Boat Writer Writing Fellow. She was also shortlisted for the 2021 Fish Poetry Prize, longlisted for the 2021 Frontier New Voices Contest, and shortlisted for the 2022 Lasco Prize. Um, so it's a pleasure to welcome Annette Sisson. Hello, um, I am from the Hoosier State and I did my master's and PhD at Indiana University Bloomington. So I love that town and um, yeah, I'm just very fond of it. It's, it's an honor to be with you tonight. Um, so I'm gonna start off with some Indiana poems. My whole family still lives in Indiana. Um, and the first is called Plass Braid. It was published in Sky Island Journal, and the byline on this poem says, Lily Rare Books Library, Indiana University. It's based on stories that I heard when I was there, and also an article I read about an intern at the Lily Rare Books Library. So Platt Braid. An intern lifts the braid, eight inches of tether slack in her tense hands. She studies the nut brown strap how to parse this text? Why this bequest? Why save the twisted plates at all? Maybe the mother sensed the girl's desire, cropped her braids like spring onions, kept them as a threat. Did the child recoil, shuddering before the scissors' silver blade? 
Did she retrieve the thick rain from the floor, brandish it in the bathroom mirror, crack it like a whip? Mm. <clears throat> the next poem um, is based on something that actually happened in Indiana when I lived there. Uh, I worked at McDonald's uh, in, in the breaks from college in the summers. And um, this is called Behind Plate Glass. Uh, you may have heard about the Burger Chef murders that took place in Speedway, Indiana on Friday, November 17th, 1978. Um, this wow. is not terribly graphic, but it is about a mass murder that took place. Um, behind Plate Glass. The problem with Burger Chef wasn't the work, but the late night fishbowl we circled on display to darkness we couldn't read. We cleaned and prepped by fluorescent light, bound by our own reflections. Some nights a grousing stranger slipped in five minutes before lockup, idled over his burger and fries. Heads down, we hewed to the groove of routine, eyes fixed on brushes as we scraped. When he shuffled to the exit, the manager unlatched the metal bolt. We hoisted brooms and mops, braved the empty dining room, relaxed into chatter as the car pulled away. Across town, west of the city, Another crew closed a burger chef. As they orbited their sphere, night blind, an assailant jimmied the padlock, edged inside. Flung in a field, skulls shot through. These workers, like us, college bound, in need of a job, still wearing the polyester uniforms we wore, dark red, striped collars and sleeves, silver buttons down the front placket, their hats lost somewhere between the plate glass building and broken corn stalks, cold November stubble. Mm. 5.30 breakfast shift, our team unlocked the doors, early light through fog. We measured coffee, poured water in the tank, Hardly spoke of the kids caked in mud. In sheets of glass, our hazy forms fluttered and paced. We filled dispensers, cracked rolls of change, traded stories of the weekend, clung to a fable of geography and sunrise, paychecks to cover the price of gas, the throb of troubled bones. Mm. <clears throat> the third poem I'd like to read um, is, um, was, is coming out in the Birmingham Poetry Review this spring. It's based on my mother, <clears throat> who grew up in Indiana. It's called Marriage at 10 Years, 1964. In long strokes, almost photographic, a meadow ripples with blooms, bits of sunlit colored glass. A path divides the field, leads to a clabbered house with large windows, tall plaster walls, a broad front porch where a woman lingers, arms wrapped around a carved white post, her skin bright as the paint, thick brown hair in waves. A calico cat rubs against her shins, noses her toe, like a Wyeth, but more color, a hopper with softer lines. My young mother at 28 treasures this image, a postcard a friend sent from New York City, keeps it in the nightstand beside the double bed she shares with her husband. She studies the life in the painting, the enameled newel, almondy sedge, the breeze, glints of color swaying, lanky stalks. She smooths morning into afternoon, wonders how to set a table as luscious as the garden she sketches in her notebook, 
a plot of hollyhocks, four o'clock she'd like to plant in spring. For now, the yard is patchy, the porch narrow, the cat and kits she took to raise deserted on a country road. She frets about rent, the cost of running a household. Inside, a throw pillow balances on the sofa back, conceals splintered plaster gouged by the brownie camera she lobbed at him for signing up to bowl a third night for his relief, stranding her at home with a toddler and baby. She consults the postcard, notes how the woman in the painting waits alone, turns to her sketch pad, pictures the garden she'll dig if the lease is renewed, the wild flower seeds she'll scatter in the front yard. Mm. Lovely. Uh, really beautiful. Really, really beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, so we now come back to our friend Jason, who has a 15-minute set for us. Jason Fickle. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much. I love hearing all the place names. Um, I, I've been told that I'm obsessed with uh, place names. Um, and my first album came out, a friend of mine started writing down all the place names that I had mentioned, and then he gave up uh, partway into that list because there were so many. And this little, this little set that I'm going to do is a lot more place name songs as well, even though none of these were on, were on the first album. This is called uh, Arkansas. You can be Oklahoma, license plate says Native America. You could be Mississippi too, it's got its highs and lows, I know. Or you could even be the greatest state of all, and that's Texas. It's bigger than you can imagine. What about being the show me state? Show me, show me, show me. It's the home of Mark Twain and Chuck Berry. Need I say more? Yes, my dear true love, you could be all the above, all above. You be the big rock, I'll be the little rock. Just let me be your Arkansas. I'm begging to be your Arkansas. And you can be Memphis, and I'll be West Memphis. Let me be your Arkansas And you can be the Delta And I'll be West Helena Just let me be your Arkansas And you can be Texarkana The one on the Texas side, of course just let me be your Arkansas. Well, you could be, dare I say, wonderful West Plains. Maybe I could be Jonesboro, 
Truman a mock tree Right on Highway 63 That's good enough for me So you be the big rock I'll be the little rock Just let me be your Arkansas And you can be Memphis I'll be West Memphis And you can be the Delta And I'll be West Helena And you can be Texarkana The one on the Texas side Just let me be your Arkansas I'm begging to be your Arkansas Arkansas, let me be your Arkansas uh, This one is uh, is about this uh, song or the story that a, a friend told me about um, in uh, in in France, uh, in Provence, specifically in the Avignon. Um, they had to explain the why the bells don't ring there on um, on the Easter, the weekend leading up to the Easter. Um, and the story is, they, they don't do that because of the uh, ritual associated with uh, those days. And so the story is that the bells fly, the church bells fly from uh, Avignon, and they fly back to Rome for those three days. That's why the bells aren't ringing. So uh, this is called The Bells of Avignon. Sit on Good Friday, them bells of Avignon We take wings and fly away to Rome You told me not to worry, but I know they're in no hurry Those bells are never coming home They ring round the Colosseum They peel through that Vatican Museum they rumble through an old catacomb Them bells ain't never coming home And it must break your poor little heart To have no Easter in France well, it's one of them things If you let the bells have wings Well, I guess you was taking that chance They ring around the Colosseum They peel through that Vatican Museum They rumble through an old catacomb Those bells ain't never coming home Run through Piazza Popolo They're looking for a Caravaggio They knock back that lemon gelato Them bells are never coming home And it just breaks my poor trusting heart To know how you're never leaving France Hey, it's one of those things If you let a lover have wings Well, I guess I was taking that chance I know you're never coming home 
I know you're never coming home I know you're never coming home Like the bells that flew from Avignon I know you're never coming home of Avignon. I didn't even know how to spell Avignon uh, when I wrote that song, but luckily uh, the person that did the graphics on that CD, they're from French Lick, um, Indiana. So they knew how to spell Avignon. This uh, last one I'm going to do uh, is uh, based on a, seri a, course, a series of correspondence I came across of my great-great-grandparents um, who lived in a place, um, uh, well, they were between two different places, really, uh, and so hence the correspondence, which has to be carried on a freight train. They were in this uh, county up in uh, kind of eastern, uh, central, north-central Kansas called uh, Cloud County. Smoky mountain lovers, they court each other by singing their true love. And it echoes through the hills and into dark hollers and high into the mountains above. But out here in Cloud County, this hot Kansas wind dries every song on my tongue. So I'll take down my pen, I'll write down my love, and drop it in the after. Noon mail to watch the freight train take it by the rail. So the smoky mountains know by how the airs go the hearts of the courting all around but here the only ones that see are the postman and me and the conductor on the train Cause out here in Cloud County This hot Kansas wind Dries every song on my tongue So I'll take down my pen I'll write down my love Drop it in the afternoon mail to watch the freight train take it by the rail Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Those were lovely. Really lovely. Um, so we now go into our next, our next round of readers. And first up is C.S. Matthews. Um, 
I'm going to start off this next round with uh, some poems from a chapbook that I have releasing in April of next year. Uh, I taught it Static Birth. And um, we're just going to start off with the titular piece. Elastic ecstasy stretched to serendipity, sweet surrender to stapled splendor, ripped into life through small death, convulsions, convalescence, pain, pleasure, menial measures. Creation is the mark of divinity, pleasure the measure. Measure me marked by birthing stars, small segmented microgasms making uterine waves, parasitic placenta peeling from pale face. Blue lit baby boy bleeding goaded cries as you lie grotesquely gutted, gripping blue sheets, bleeding, bloodied, screaming. There's nothing but pain left in you. So I think I should mention that this book is about the intersections between violent birth and um, opiate addiction in the Midwest. And um, the idea of an ecstatic birth or an orgasmic birth just kind of struck me as kind of an uh, interesting way to view that angle. Uh, the next piece is called Heroine's Happy Cousin. Cyclical, serendipitous, surrender, sanity to sanctuary and saran wrapped corpses. Body bags built to bury, burned remains, blackened barbecued briquettes of seared semi-preserved smoked stones stacked in seven rows. Homes the house, heroine's happy cousin, heckled at heaven's gate. Its war on ownness owned by oneness operated in open casket head wounds. Next one is Botfly Baby. Blisters congeal, or blisters form congeal till calluses are convalescent and in tearing reveals skin new, tender and squirming from epidermal womb. While you that remains is condemned to tomb of flaking shrapnel, bloody remains, body unmade. Bad trip. Tab tipped tongue trips, building bodies that break down, disappearing, decayed, dormant, malevolent, modulating through molten flesh or molten flesh festering and sunken sin. This is where ego dies to be born again, as asinine comments carry weighted worry, making melting bodies blurry. Do they even see you? Beyond the bits and bods they want to consume, starry eyed stares, signaling hunger or high. Can't decide, yet youthful experiments expand horizons until horizontal glances find no land. I guess this is a, I guess this is how I die. Fallopian interludes. Turbulent trials take root, reading rooms for youth, but Trouble transit ends in fallopian interludes, undetected uh, egg topic eruptions, corrections illegal under law, fatal flaw, blood beginning never ending until ending in a grave for two. And the next one is through the looking glass. Tuned carapace dissolves, devolves in primordial permutations. Look here, Alice. Digestive enzymes emulate submarine organs. They float in what used to be you, grotesque goo, germinating garish grapplings. Does it hurt? Self-harm, self-growth, liquidity and liquefied surrender, supplication to serendipitous pain or pleasure. I will fly if not devoured and evolve desecrated digestive dirges. I burn. All right. and the the closing piece for this collection is America is Unborn. Lesions in liminal space, tears that take time to contemplate an opiate a fueled haze. The Midwest has no time, just uppers to pull the downers back from the edge, choking on the dredges of vomit in the back of their throat, dreaming of America. As the paramedics narc in a body outside the corpse of a mall and they say it's a body, but they try and they had flags on their shoulders to remind them of their side when they swept through drone damage to check if any soldiers died, tossing civilians to the side. And this is a paramedic's mind as she shoves her fingers between cooling lips to clear airways that atrophy with every second. Outside the mall, she lodges a child, now a corpse. 
like the wreckage in Kuwait, tossing bodies to the side to find tides to bury, and she's pumping on his chest, breathing into purple lips. Oh, 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 staying alive. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Those were really powerful. Very powerful. Our next reader is Annette Sisson. Hello again. Hello. Um, I, I didn't mention that all the, the poems that I'm reading tonight are from my new book manuscript. Uh, it's called Winter Shark with Apples, and um, it's just beginning the quest for publishers. So um, in this section there, I, I think you'll see a mother-daughter theme. <laughs> um, the first poem is called Turf. Um, it was published in Third Wednesday, and it has an epigraph from Danusha Lamaris's Bonfire Opera. She has a poem in there called The Grass, and the quote is, grass is a shag rug lay, uh, laid over the scuffed floors of history. So my poem is called Turf. My daughter nudges the praying mantis marooned high on the storefront window. Its body, a tapered spear of celery. Below, cliffs of glass, rivers of cement, prairies of asphalt. She rifles through her bag, pulls out a bank deposit slip, slides it under the mantis, the sagging paper on the checkbook, glide steps away, mindful as a bride processing. When she reports the tiny corner of green she found behind Target, I nod, tell her a story, the iniquities of grass. Dazzled by Europe's fussy lawns, the founding fathers imported carpets of emerald, Monticello, Mount Vernon, golf courses green as cash, diamond cut suburbs, the decadence of irrigation. Grass and invasive snuffs out weeds and wildflowers, then pollen, bees, flies, the feasts of predator insects. Perhaps this history of lawns is redeemed by its sweet blades, fibers from the hair of the dead. But our loves strewn about us in acres of green might have become mantises, feeding on pollinators, cavorting on dappled rugs of meadow, part blue star part dandelion. The next poem is um, coming out in the Valparaiso Poetry Review, and it is based on a story I heard on NPR. Um, so it's mother-daughter, but it's not personal. Um, it's called Under a White Moon. A daughter, now 82, spends a decade grubbing in dirt unburying the transplanted roots of her life. She returns to this place, searches for roses, Granada War Relocation Center, rocky, once covered with chain link, barbed wire, 7,000 Japanese Americans fenced away like nightshade. After Pearl Harbor, her mother took a cutting from her lost grandparents' rose bush, stashed, stashed it into a sacharu under a slim volume of basho, a hand mirror inlaid with mother of pearl, tokens to fuel dreams of pagodas, lotus blossoms imperial as kabuki. At the camp, the mother waited for the moon's white shine planted the shoot while the guards slept, wormed her way out of the hammock to a patch of land with thicker soil, dug the hole with a borrowed spoon and pearl handle. Now, eight decades later, the daughter finds one pink bloom, a bud on a small bramble, petals drawn tight as a pill bug, 
She remembers the dusty corners of the wire enclosure, sees her mother's hands grafting roses, hears her whisper to the stem's nodes. It's the roots that save, push them deep. And the last poem I'll read uh, in this set um, is uh, called The Unfolding, and it's based on my daughter spent um, four months studying in Spain and Madrid, and at the end we came to visit her. Unfolding. My daughter hands me a fan to disperse the swelter of Spain, black tapered slats, scarlet roses, cuts of lattice below the spread of blossoms, accordion like her life in Madrid, where she flutters through unlit streets, scorches her skin under alien sun, recites conversation scripts alone, dances at a discotheque while her phone, coat, purse, all her money are taken. Still, she sculpts the hours into alabaster clouds, fastens them to an arch of royal sky. She positions the fan between my thumb and index finger, tilts my wrist, snaps hers open, demonstrates how to stir the sultry afternoon, shuffle heat, froth it like meringue, how to conjure breeze from sheer air. Really lovely imagery. I hope, Annette, please read the um, lovely comments in the chat. So our third reader in this set is Soleil David. And, um, and after Soleil reads, we'll go into just a one piece each and the um, order will be uh, Annette Sisson, Soleil David and CS and they'll each be reading one piece each. So Soleil. Um, <clears throat> so for, for this set, I'll, um, I'll read a translation. Um, I took up, I fully embraced literary translation in Bloomington while I was doing my MFA. Um, right now I am working on a translation of short stories by the um, non-binary author and director, uh, Carlo Paolo Pacolor. And their um, short story collection is called Un Compendio de Mai Impossible en Bagay, or the Compendium of Impossible Objects. Mm -hmm. And this is the first story. It's called Silid One or Room One. Um, the story begins with our main character buying a lock from a mysterious shop after finding his house had been ransacked. He goes back home only to find that the installation instructions aren't as easy as he thought. He didn't believe what the shopkeeper had said about the effectiveness of the lock. He wanted to return it, thinking he might want the spherical one instead. But what would be the use since he knew and would have to accept that he just wasn't good with anything complicated? He liked his stuff easily solvable. No manuals needed, user friendly, one touch. But here he now was, bereft of everything, except for the gramophone he had brought home the night he'd found his home ransacked. He'd immediately called his father to tell him, even prepared his story, but how to get to the end, he hadn't been and still wasn't sure, or he lacked the courage to give this circuitous explanation. The fridge had been taken, but its contents had been left behind. The DVD player was gone, but not the DVDs. And the computer, what a surprise. It was also stolen except for the motherboard, as if the thief were saying, your memories are no use to me. He ended up just telling his father he'd visit home in a few days. He asked the neighbors, did you see anyone sneak in or anyone go out? But none of them had seen anything. And in his rage, he found himself scream screaming, I hope you all go blind then. He didn't even try calling the police and he stopped thinking about it because he already knew that solving the mystery was beyond his mental acumen. He spent several hours standing in front of his open door, expecting his belongings to just walk back in his 36-inch flat screen swaying on its feet, drunk, 
his sound system rolling toward him, and his CPU frazzled and out of it, asking for its stolen brain back. Whoever had done this to him was clearly heartless, had a crooked soul, an impure conscience, and most of all, was in possession of some kind of mystical power. Come to think of it, it's said that in the event of a fire, you'd find yourself able to lift anything, even things that weigh a ton. And after 24 hours, he decided to forgive the thief or thieves and quickly went out to buy a new lock. When he came back home, he saw footprints. The criminal had come back to the scene of the crime. He didn't feel nervous, just shouted into the emptiness, are you here? No one answered. He repeated himself, reddening with rage. You son of a whore, are you here? Show yourself. He tore his house apart and he laughed at himself. Where was anyone going to hide? Behind the wall? The rafters? Underneath the floor? He tore his house apart. He fell asleep on the floor. When he woke up, he saw the tiny feet of an ant. It was headed toward the lake of his drool and he quickly squashed it between his fingers. He wanted coffee, but only the water container was left and the dispenser was no more. His coffee packet was still there, what would have been his morning cup had the coffee maker not been taken. He played Sarah Vaughan, read the instruction manual, stood next to the window, and the live-in is easy, Fisher jump in, and he again read how to install the lock with a handle and the dial. The Taha vendor shouted his wares in the morning, and the Balut vendor shouted his wares at night. The town fiesta took place, and summer came hot on its heels, followed by rain and a flood that finally receded, and the family next door started a new family, and he was still there, waiting. Waiting for what? For whom? The footprints disappeared, replaced by his own. The world forgot about him, even his friends and co-workers, former lovers and loves. He waited another day and a half. And when still no one came, when at last the mold on all the rotten food blossomed and the spores flew into the air, he installed the lock. He attached it to the edge of the door. He turned the handle, then pulled up the lever. He turned the dial four times. He repeated the second and third steps twice while counting backward from five, four, three, two, one. Thank you. And it will be Annette, <clears throat> excuse me, Annette Soleil and CS. One piece. Okay. Um, so the last poem um, is about my parents and um, and me, I suppose. Um, and it's called Her Offering, and it was published in Rust and Moth. I planted cantaloupe in my front yard last spring, a sweet ground cover annual among perennials. One by one, before they could ripen, their skins split, coral flush gaping. I suspected raccoon, possum, deer, the heat. Not the eastern box turtle plodding through shadowed <laughs> vines, snug under its stenciled carapace, saffron-eyed among chiseled rinds, spilled seeds the raw viscera of loss. Three years before, my mother proffered a list of marriage partners for my father or after she passed. The roll call of candidates carried on, my mother then too frail to deliver her lines. I preserved the spectacle of my silence, never performed her part, even as she made her bow. Today in this garden, honeyed with carnage, I see my mother's kindness, how she offered herself, the fruit of her overripe body, untangled the withering vine of her illness, fashioned him a sequel, a shell like a shield etched with widow's names. Perhaps she hoped one would slip the cover off, crack open the hull of him, gather the scattered kernels, 
salvage a cantaloupe roughly inscribed before summer's end. Fantastic. Um, this this last poem is um, about well, political defeat, um, societal defeat. Um, what happens when uh, the generation of your parents fight against a, a fascist and um, his son comes back and becomes president of your home country? It's called Coming Back to D.C. Days After the Filipino Dictator's Son Wins the Presidency. Mm. In my absence, the neighborhood had sprung into verdure, green leaves clumping at every branch. In my apartment, I had found myself sobbing over my country once again. It's times like these, it's clear how I lack the optimism of the revolutionary, the certainty of victory in the face of stunning defeat. I am given to despair too easily, so easily lose my nerve. And I've never wanted seasons. I wanted summer all the time. I don't have the patience of a year, the faith of cycles. There is no evidence now of winter's glowing cold, its refusal to share the strange life it holds. And there is no evidence, too, that it could end, except that one morning, while I was washing dishes, I spied flurry outside my window and, angry, panicked, aghast, I ran to look out to what must be blizzard in March, except, of course, they were cherry blossom petals wafting past, telling me, hey, look again, let all your senses absorb this. So much is changing. All right, um, for this last poem, uh, I'm going to read a piece dedicated to Bill Sovereign. Oh. His uh, birthday was uh, earlier this week and they released his ashes and to the uh, Ohio. So uh, this is a piece I wrote after. Reminent, rem or, uh, reminent revenants. There were a stack of clean dishes next to the sink when he died. And I wonder if she cleaned them, having come into his apartment, either before or after. There was so much time before. And I very much doubt he washed them. He was an artist after all. My mind wanders to my own sink. Will there be dishes? Will my panties be clean, free of discharge from the root of my shame? Does it really matter? And why do I keep bringing it back to myself when it wasn't me who died and I'm somewhat alive, at least in this moment? But what will they find upon cleaning out my belongings? His records were sky high and my father's estate still drains mine. My brother had a trunk my mother refuses to open. It collects dust. As we parsed out the dust collectors, it still does. I imagine them coming onto a scene of never ending laundry, though I just made room in the closet for my wife. We rolled up the excess in a blanket, the same one his dining room was wrapped in, and tied it with the same rope. We joked about it being a body as we kicked it down the stairs It weighed as much, it was too hard to carry. We laughed at our lack of skill and corpse removal, but now I think it was a body, the accumulated bits of life, the life of a poet in 17 boxes. I sat at his dining room table, the one his mother prized to write this. I guess it's mine now, but I imagine him drinking coffee from the same mug I am, who was sitting clean next to his sink. I can't let it sit dirty next to mine. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, Jason, Jason, do you want to take us out? Yes, and I want to thank you all. It's so wonderful to listen to this amazing variety of poetry, just amazing variety and depth. I love it. It's it, And thank you so much for having me. I, I think I played a, a version of this event in the um, in, the, in an earlier phase of the, um, this ongoing pandemic. So I'm glad to be welcome back. I'm going to close mm -hmm. out with one called uh, John 1, 2, 3. I had the taxi man drop me where the depot used to be 
I had my table all marked up for John 123. Well, my grip was in my right hand, credentials on my chest. Elgin watch tick tock in my vest. No hands, no train, no sign. Well, my Stetson had been dusted, I had band clean. Roll up in my black boot, all colored green. Well, I look down to the switchyard. And I touch my winds a knot And I ask that lazy drummer there What time he got, he said No hands No train No sign No hand No train No sign Someday you'll be lonely, lonely just like me. You look for one to help you, none will you see. You can stare down the drummer, you can stare into the sun, pray for a locomotive, but don't mean it comes. No hang, no train. No hand, no train, no sign. Thank you. And um, once again, if you enjoy Jason, you'll also enjoy his taste in uh, curating music, which is always a wonderful part of Blue Monday on WFHB. So a couple of last announcements. Next month, Wednesday, December 7th, we are reviving our annual Christmas tradition of the Junkies Christmas and a Ray Bradbury play called It Burns Me Up, in which I play um, Tony's wife who maybe killed him. Um, that will be at the back door and uh, details to come. So please watch the website and the newsletter. And a reminder that starting in February, we're going to be uh, moving back into person and we'll be going to the back space, which is the performance space attached to Bunfett up on the square. But I think we decided tonight that we might be trying to live stream it as well. So also watch for details. And lastly, I know Tony and I are going over now to the Black House to hear to see our third partner in crime, Kyle Quas, playing with Bacalam Bob Moses and Damon Smith. And there was a show that started at 7:30, and there'll be another set at nine. And that is at the Black House Bar in Bloomington. So thank you to everybody. Um, very moving. And Snow, thank you for thanks for reading something about Bill. So good night to you all. <laughs>